So let me switch to English because Bridget will be speaking in English. Uh, Bridget uh, represents Google for Entrepreneurs, so she'll tell you a few words about that, and uh, she wants to share her ideas on which, on what data needs for entrepreneurs. So please, Bridget, come on stage. Uh, hello, I'm Bridget, Bridget Beam. I work on this team, Google for Entrepreneurs. I'm based out of Google's headquarters in California. Um, a little bit about my team before I get started. I, I don't want to bore you too long, um, but it's a great team. We basically focus on how Google can foster entrepreneurship around the world, how we can help you provide, get you the resources, the programs, the partners, the opportunities you need to be successful. This is our website. Um, if you ever have a chance, it's actually super useful. Uh, we put on these classes uh, online, which are free, and these are normally paid classes. A lot of them are taught by Googlers and product managers, marketers. Also, many of them are taught by experts outside of Google. Um, we release one every week, pretty much. So if you follow us on Google+, Plus, we put up new content all the time. Um, we also have great events, so if you ever have a chance, you can check out some of the events like this that are here. Again, we also post those to Google+, Plus. so if you guys are interested, um, it's really about bringing Googlers and our talent to you to help you be successful. Um, and that's what today is about. So please, if you have questions, ask them. All the Googlers in the room, can you please raise your hand? See, there's a lot. The ratio is quite high. Beware. Just kidding. But there are a lot of people here to help you, so please ask questions. First of all, who's, can, who is willing to volunteer and tell me why you're here? Or give me your pitch. What does your company do? Yeah? Okay, here we go. Hi, everybody. I'm Raphael from Speedshow. And I'm here to learn a lot from uh, Google. And uh, first of all, I have one question. Why does Google does this? Why does this? Yeah. What does your company do? My company uh, is a... Uh, we, we're making again the pitch, so it's your company. So it's like a way to take notes in a more intelligent way. Thank you. All right, the question was why Google does this. It's a good question. So if you think about Google as a search engine, um, we need really great content out there to make the web really valuable, right? If you search and there's nothing there, or if you're trying to find an application and there's nothing there for you, it's not very useful. Google is very much a platform for other people to succeed as much as we succeed, right? We only succeed if entrepreneurs do, so that's why this program exists. Does that make sense? Cool. Anybody else want to volunteer? I promise I'll talk about something else in a minute, but I want some examples for my presentation, huh? Oh, way in the back, can you yell? All right. All right. Hey everyone, my name is Thierry, and I have built a little recipe platform. Do you cook, Professor? Yes, okay. a lot. So, you can earn money with us, thanks to your recipes. So we buy recipes, we give you 20 bucks. You buy my recipes, Yes, I do. 20 bucks. So, I would like Google to help me to pay people with Google Checkout, and I would like you to feature my application in the Android App Store. Please do that. Okay, so I do learn here on Android. I want also to have a good referencing on Google Plus. Please give me some good devices because we need to bring people who are going global, so we need your This guy is going to be super busy today, running around. To okay, sounds good. Well, what I want to talk about today, um, I am an entrepreneur myself. I work with two entrepreneurs very intimately. One is my husband, and one is my mother. Um, there's a lot of, like my family has a ton of businesses. Everybody is running around making things, helping people, doing stuff. Um, so I, on a daily basis, actually help monitor Google Plus pages, AdWords, analytics, all of the above. Um, and so today I actually want to share with you some of my, I don't have very much time to do this. I have a full-time job. It's probably more like two full-time jobs. And then this is something I do on the side. You're also very, very busy people, right? And you need to know what kind of decisions to make on a daily basis. So I'm actually just going to share a little bit about what I do every day with my, my family's businesses to help them. Um, and I think it's really valuable for you as an entrepreneur. So I want to talk about data. All right, It's a very hot topic. Everybody loves to talk about data and infographics. But very, very few of the time do they find it useful, data being useful. So I talk about a few forces. First, everybody likes numbers, so I'll share some cool Google numbers with you. But essentially, we all know the world has changed. Um, there's a blog out there called like Failed Dinners. Have you guys seen this? 
Okay, it's basically a bunch of people or people on a date who go out to dinner together and they spend the whole time on their phone. And people like take pictures of them and then they send it to this blog. It's actually hilarious. Um, it's very sad, but hilarious. Um, so some of the reasons that things have changed are really because of these two forces. One force is information. So we have this explosion in information. You have the ability to have access to as much data as you want, right? If you don't have analytics, if you don't search data, right, look for data sets around your industry, you should. So this is really overwhelming. If you want to look at 30 trillion URLs, I don't even know what trillion looks like. Never tried. If you want to give me 30 trillion dollars, I'm okay with that. Um, and then the other force is really increase in access. So if you look at these numbers, think of all the people who are getting online who did not get online before, right? 1.5 million Android activations per day. That's a lot more people coming online that didn't, that weren't online before. These are new customers. These are different types of customers. These are customers accessing your device, and app, your application, your website, your business through multiple devices. This is a new segment of the market that did not exist that, much, that long ago. Um, how many people remember life before phones, cell phones? We had one of those in like a suitcase in the car, like when I was younger for emergencies. I think it cost like $40 a minute. And it was never charged, it never worked. I don't think they used it. Um, but it was really cool. Um, Two billion internet searches globally. And this is actually um, another stat that's not up here. It's 15% of searches every single day are new. So 15% of the searches that Google sees on a daily basis have never been searched before. That's actually very interesting. You think of search as kind of a stagnant thing, people looking up recipes, people looking up information on a, on a very uh, flat level, but a lot of these are brand new searches. Okay, so with all this information, how do we make useful of, use of it? So information is as powerful essentially as your ability to use it. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how do you use your data? And we're even going to have Vince Surf tell us how do you use your data? He's like godfather, grandfather of the internet. He's very nice if you ever get a chance to meet him. Is like really cozy grandfather like. Um, okay, so we're going to talk two forces. First, or the two segments. First is the macro data. Um, I come from an economics and math background, and I love to talk about economics. So if you guys want to talk about that later, I'm happy to. But macro data. This is all the forces in the world, all of the industry forces, all of the uh, demographic forces, the financial forces that are having an impact on your business. So first of all, I'm going to show you some tools. It's up to you to figure out how to use them for your own business. Um, these are tools. Hopefully, uh, I used to do this. I'll do it again. I'll give you guys one euro if you do not learn something during this presentation, all right? It's my challenge. The one euro. I think I only have like three euros on me, so I really have to do well. Um, how many of you guys have heard of Google Public Data Explorer? Yes. I'm doing good already. OK, so this is a tool. Basically what it is is government data and data that's um, publicly available to the world that has never been put in a usable format. So this is data from the UN, um, this is data from the US government, from the Eurozone. So I'm gonna go here. You can just find this at Google Public Data Explorer. So I'll show you their example um, here on the site. So this is actually just showing from the World Economic Indicators life expectancy via country and over time. So this is pretty cool. Um, how many of you guys have heard of Google, uh, there's a map tool, I can't think of a map tool. These are basically open public data sets. This tool you can actually use. You can actually ingest your own data and use these graphical tools. I'll show you them really quickly here. Very cool. This is one on the world. Um, and this is the one across time. So if you want to explore data sets, and think about this, if you Let's imagine that the, the, the country or the state or the region that you do the best in has a particular broad, broadband penetration, has a particular uh, level of Android devices or iOS devices, has a particular amount of disposable income, right? These are factors like, let's say a country that you choose to enter or a country you choose to focus on, you want it to look like what? How could you find other countries like that? How do you measure the forces that look into the world? So you can look at unemployment, which is super exciting. You guys don't have to worry about unemployment, you're self-employed. Um, marriage, divorce, mortality, population. But essentially what you can do in this uh, tool is find some of the interesting data that will have an impact. 
on your business. So let's look at unemployment rates. Let's imagine you have an application or a game that people spend a lot of time on when they're unemployed, right? Like Facebook or like, tell me an application that you guys have. Let's see, anyone here make games? Games? Yeah, see, if you don't have a job, you're going to play a lot more games. So let's pick out some countries here. Let's see real quickly how this changes. So we can see sort of this over time. Um, we can see it on the graph, like I said. But you can actually get really, um, really detailed if you go down to age group. You can go by age group. You can go by, so maybe you want a certain amount of people in a certain category. This is the other reason that this tool is great is if you are going towards investors. Investors always want to know about the trends that impact your business and how whatever decision you're making is about those trends, right? So that's something to consider. I'll let you guys do more with this tool. Um, like I said, you can also ingest uh, data as well and keep it private. All right, how about Google Trends? How many people have used Google Trends before? Okay, this is actually my favorite tool. Um, I'll show you some really cool things on it real fast. And they keep changing it, so it, it just got new this week. This is a problem with live demos. Google's always changing products, so I stand up here and I'm like, hey, that's not how it looked yesterday. I have no idea what happened. So we just go to Google Trends. What this is, is essentially Google search data across all of Google's platforms. So we also provide search for other search engines as well, and ask like AOL.com, a bunch of those different groups. Um, so this is really accurate search data. If you go to this explore section, um, so I got some examples here. Let's say digital, digital publishing. I talked to some folks before. One second. Okay, so I talked to a gentleman earlier who was interested in digital publishing. So if you want to look here, you can see sort of this over time, this graph over time. Um, and then you can look down here over city and region. Um, and then you can see rising search terms. So like potentially Adobe Digital Publishing and whatnot. We can also add terms, or sorry, we're gonna add locations, sorry about that. Okay, so we're basically taking all of Google's search data and adding filters so that we can see better information. I'm not sure why time ranges, so we'll say past 12 months. So I come down here, I can see over the past 12 months, sort of the, cha the change in time. If I wanted to, I could actually do this, where I go 2013, 2012, 2011. All right, so I can see how this industry has changed over time. See what I'm saying? So we're looking at digital publishing over these years in the US. So what's interesting about this is how does this help you make decisions? Um, if we pull out of, let's say, the US, let's say, I don't know how I go back to the world. They just changed this. Okay, we're just going to pretend. Um, but essentially what you could do is, where do you focus your marketing dollars? Where do you focus your effort? These are people who are already searching for whatever you're providing, so it's worth noting. Um, you can also look at seasonality. So it appears that people look for digital publishing more in January, less in June, July, and then more um, in the upper ranges, right? So if you're going to allocate your financial resources or your own personal time, you would look at that graph. All right, so this is my family business. We do outdoor design, spatial design, my husband and I. Well, mostly him. I just play with the numbers, mostly. But if you look at, for us, for example, we have this huge cyclical factor, right, in our business that changes how we spend our money and how we spend our resources. We should pretty much just go on holiday from, like, October through December. We should just go on vacation, not work at all. There's nothing going on. Um, anyone else have an example? Actually, I wanted to show you one more thing. Um, and this is a real example. I helped... A guy in the U.S., um, he lives he lives in New Orleans, he runs a macaroon company. Um, the macaroons are not as popular outside of France as they are well known. And we were looking at new areas for him to create uh, opportunity for his business. He says that on search in the U.S., he is completely saturated, right? He cannot, like, he cannot buy any more keywords, he cannot do anything else, he can't bid on anything else. <clears throat> so we looked here at this map, and we can see Actually, Canada has more search volume than the U.S., right? So even though his business is U.S., he should consider, like, figuring out how to ship his business to Canada, like, to ship some of his products to Canada. If he can figure out Australia, there's a huge opportunity there as well, right? Um, a lot of times, this is a great tool to learn about those new industries and also to learn how people in, like, in Australia or learn how people in a certain place are actually searching for things. 
So if I were you guys, I would definitely take time to look at this. I think it's really great. Um, up here too, which we didn't look at, is all categories. So if you're not certain about what search, you can actually get super, super specific. Okay, well there's no macaroons in auto and car. But if we pull up auto and car, you can just even see these basic search, um, basic search trends. And then you can actually look at like specific vehicles. So say bicycles and accessories. So look at the cyclical nature of this searches, right? Bikes go up and down. So if I were you, I would spend time on a monthly basis to look and see what trends there are that are affecting your business, your industry. Um, on a yearly basis when you're planning, look at those spikes. If you have a travel site, look at what days of the week people travel, look for travel most. There is actually days of the week, there are actually days of the month. Um, close to holidays that will factor in. You want to be smart about the time and resources that you spend and how they map to data. Good? Yeah? Okay. You guys are like, this girl's just talking. talking. All right. Um, this is another really cool tool, and it's called uh, Google Think Insights. Anybody know what this is? I think I'm going to save my three euros that I have. It's good. I need to uh, take the subway back. So basically what this is, Google actually commissions a lot of research to be done, right? Research about industries, research about the net, web, how um, industries are functioning. This website has like a ridiculous amount of things going on for it. Um, if you go down here, you can actually see like uh, a lot of case studies, but there's a ton of data. So this is actually gonna tell you all the mobile stats for France. This is a study on mobile stats for France. This is uh, store insights from case studies, so uses of phones. Um, buying new cars. These are all these studies that have been commissioned, right? 55% uh, of smart, smartphone owners in France access the internet daily from their device. 58% um, of impressions delivered by YouTube reach people who are exposed to TV. Um, so if you just think about like all, there's a whole repository of really great data specific to industries. If you just search like for countries, for industries, all of the data that we commission and all of the industry reports are there. So it's super cool. Um, really like concise. They have like a infographic creator on here as well. It's very interesting. At the end of the day, what I would do is figure out what sources. It could not even be these sources are reliable for you for data, right? Like, what numbers do you need to know every month, every quarter, um, in order to figure out how to spend your time, your money, and your resources, and how to make your products better? Uh, this is another one which I won't go through, but. Um, it's focused on sort of mobile, mobile trends and mobile devices. It's called Think Mobile, or Our Mobile Planet. It's actually called Our Mobile Planet. It's also a site created by Google that has a ton of like mobile-specific trends and data. Um, if you think about all these marketplaces in the world, there are often cheaper ways for you to get customers, right? There's um, Chrome Web Store, there's, there's the Google Apps Marketplace, there's a whole bunch of these. Also, a lot of good marketplaces to get um, things done cheaper, right? So 99designs, this is a, a, a marketplace for designers. This is about your data, your data as a company. How do you deal with your data? How do you make sense of it? So this is a great, this was one of my favorite examples. You can't tell very well on this, but who knows this top box at Google? It's basically our most coveted, most prized uh, position right on Google, right? If you can. Um, manage to bid and also have a high quality score, you can be on the very top of Google, right? The color of that box, anybody want to tell me what the color, you can't see it very well here, but the color of that box. Anybody color? It's kind of like pink, kind of fleshy, like peach. It's pretty ugly, right? <coughs> like who would have guessed that the most expensive real estate on our site would be peach? Like I would never guess this, right? Seems terrible. Um, Actually, over the years, that color has changed. I mean, hues of the same color. Blues, greens, oranges, yellows, all different colors. And the reason is because we have goals. Every website, everything on your website or your application should have a goal. The goal of our most important real estate is to do two things. It is to, first of all, not annoy you, right? If this was bright red or fluorescent green, you'd be like, oh my goodness, this is awful. I hate Google, that is the worst color ever, and you would go to use some other search engine, which I don't even know if it's out there. Um, but the other goal is to make money, right? We want people, if this is a good advertisement, to choose to click on it, correct? So those are the two goals. So with those two goals in mind, 
this was the color that we came up with. In the short term, if we made this hot pink, we could probably get more people to click on it, right, for two days, and then they would never come back. When you have a, whatever application or website you have, the most important elements of your site, you have to test. You have to try different things. I would never have chosen this color. My instinct would be wrong. This is the, like, through the data, this is the color that we have chosen because it does, it achieves our two goals correctly. So now I'm going to play a little game. Everybody ready to play this game? I love games. Um, and we're going to talk about, like, how wrong your intuition is, right? This is the point of this game. It's not a great game. The point of the game is for you to be wrong. All right. So back in 2008, um, when Obama ran for president in the US, um, there was a group that helped him optimize his website. They used a tool called Website Optimizer, which no longer exists. It's now called Content Experiments. It's in analytics. If you want me to write that down for you, I will. It's very complicated. There's also a non-Google product called Optimizely. Basically, what it allows you to do is A-B test, A-B-C test. So to test different versions of your site towards a goal. A lot of people test their website and have no goal. If you have no goal, you should just shut it down and go home, right? So the goal of this site was to um, get more people to sign up, right? Get more people to sign up to volunteer, which you can see at the bottom, and to get more people to donate money. And you also want to volunteer. So the goal is like, he wants people to come to this site, take action, right? And then he wants them to subsequently continue on that site, donate money, like volunteer those things, okay? So you guys are all gonna vote. There's two things that were tested. The image, the large image, which you can see there, and then this, this red button. So I'm gonna show you first the images, you're gonna vote on one through three, I'm gonna show you four buttons, then we're gonna see who gets it right, okay? There's nothing to win except awesome. Right? Okay. So, uh, who votes number one? Okay, great. Who votes number two? Okay, great. Who votes number three? Okay. All right, you guys ready? So these are the options. Okay, who votes number Sign up. Who votes the button sign up is the most effective button? One guy, two guys. Good. Way to stick with your conviction. Number two, learn more. Okay, a few more. Number three, join us now. Solid. Number four, sign up now. Okay. So what I'm going to show you is a very old interface of the website optimizer. So what we can see here is the combination that was most effective is the family image, which I'll go back to, and then the button learn more. Um, and the results of this, so the delta, what we mean is the trajectory of the first site versus the end result of the second site. So the difference was actually 2.8 more subscriptions, 2.8 more people signed, million people signed up, $57 million more was donated based on a button and an image, okay? So the original one, I'll show you, this one was actually the original one right here. So look, it looks good, right? It doesn't look like the family image, which we'll go back to, over there, that doesn't look $57 million more awesome, does it? I mean, it definitely doesn't, but it actually was. So, what I'm, my message here is, you have to trust the data. Sometimes there, like our intuition is that we made a website, we made an application, and it's amazing, and we love it, and your mom loves it, and your wife loves it, and your girlfriend loves it, but the reality is if the users love it, Right? Small, small changes can make a huge impact on your site. My recommendations if you're going to test is test the most important things. If you notice, he didn't change the entire site, even though it looks like it. The, the fields are the same. Um, it's just the image and the button, because that's what matters. So things to test on your site, like the more simple, the better, the less text, the better, the less fields, the better. Um, consolidating the first experience. So this was the first experience. I'm sure after this you had to sign up for something else. You had to enter a credit card. You had to do something to pay this person. But the reality is that first experience, that entry point, was really easy and it was tested. It was something that was data driven. So, okay, now that I've convinced you to all test your website, um, you can use Google Analytics. How many people use Google Analytics in here? It's free and it's amazing. So um, I would definitely use it. I use it. I love it. 
Um, how I use this tool functionally, I also use AdWords. So every day I get an email, there's custom reports. You can set up custom reports in analytics, and I only get two numbers sent to me every day because there's so much data in analytics, right? When you get in there, you're like, whoa, this is really confusing, and I don't even know what I care about anymore. Before you open your analytics account, you should write down, I'm literally not joking, write down the questions that you have. Like, where is my company doing the best? How much are my costs per conversion? Where's my traffic coming from? Which social media outlets, which of the social media outlets I'm doing are not just bringing the most traffic, but bringing the most conversions, right? Like, you need to think about what data is actually meaningful to your business, and the rest of it, just worry about on a quarterly basis, because you can't, you honestly just can't ingest that much information. I can't, on a daily basis. So I set up automated emails, custom reports every single day, and I get cost per conversion every day, um, and basically a number of conversions. And then on a weekly basis, I look up other information, because that's really all I care about. I mean, everything else is just noise, um, and it's, it's useful noise, but it's not useful every day, right? It's not useful every minute to me. So I would think about that with analytics. Do, do, do set up custom reporting. It'll come to your email or your phone or whatever you want. And think about the, if you had to have two pieces of information every morning that would help you make a better business, what would they be? Or the three? And narrow it down, because it will help you drive better customers, better users, whatever it is that you're looking to do. It'll make the customer experience and your experience better. Um, so this is a random tip of the day. Uh, if you have internal search, how many people have internal search on their website or application, whatever they're working on? Okay, people never look at internal search on analytics. It's basically if you have a search box inside of your actual website, those are people telling you exactly what they're looking for and that they cannot find it. Um, if you match that plus like the keywords that come to your site, there's a lot of interesting analysis you can do there on an individual basis, so I would consider doing that. Okay. Last area, I promise I'll sit down. Um, this is really about social, even though I didn't put social. You have a community of people, hopefully, like a social community, another community that are influencers. Most people treat not only every single social medium, but every single like user the same. That is completely wrong. Like This is um, Google Ripples, which is in Google Plus. Essentially what it shows is when I post something, this is not me posting, this, I'm not the Dalai Lama, which is actually the person who posted this, which is kind of weird, but um, essentially, when I post something, who are the people that are actually sharing who are having the biggest influence, right? Those people are influencers. Those are my salesmen. Those are my marketers. Those are my people who are out there like selling my products for me. I should not ignore them. They should be different, right? They're like literally free salesmen, free marketing people to you. So. I will tell you a little lesson here. This is Google Docs. We have people every single day who are not employed by Google who spend hours and hours, literally their entire day almost, contributing to the Google Docs forum. They are not Google employees. They just love our products. They are just like those people who are here who are influencers. They are the same people who are really in love with our products. We send them swag. We send them tickets to Google I.O. When there's a problem, we call them. We have their email addresses. We engage with these people because they are our front line, right? They are the people who are making our products better. We call them up, how do we fix the product? What's going on? Do you see an issue here? Do you see a problem there? You need to take care of the people who are taking care of you um, and those influencers. So people, if you have a lot of people who reshare your posts, your tweets, whatever it is, like don't ignore them. Get in touch with them individually and say, hey, I want your product feedback. I want to have a relationship with you, right? I want to talk to you, because they are like literally free employees. These are people who are working every day to make docs better without our guidance, right? So do not ignore those people. And that, those people are in your data. So if you don't take time to look at the data that's influencing your business, you will not find them. So I recommend that you. Um, this is my, my last but best slide. Um, the other thing I think about with data is, is a lot of people look at crowdsource funding as a way to make money, right? How many of you guys have ever had a crowdsource fund funding campaign? Do you guys know what crowdsource funding is? Okay, so essentially you make a video, a video pitch about your product, you put it online. Uh, this is a site called Indiegogo, which is actually global. You can 
can actually fundraise here. Um, you send it out there, you try to send it to your whole network, and get people to um, donate funds, <coughs> submit funds to your project or your business idea or your whatever you're doing, like Kickstarter. Um, often though, what people do is, if you donate, let's say five euro, I think this guy was like five dollars, he will actually send you the first version of his product for free. Or he'll give you early access to the application. These are people who are willing to pay for a product that does not exist and may never exist, right? This is real validation. This is real customer validation. This is people who are willing to pay for your product before you created it. That's data. That's data about $62,572,000 worth of money that somebody gave to you based on your product idea, without even the product, or based on the idea, the hope that it will exist and they'll get it. So what I would consider, the reason I like this example, it's a little bit funny, I'm gonna play this video for you, is because this man is 78 years old. Is there anyone in here that's older than 78? Okay, so he can make a crowdsourced funding campaign, so can you. And he is actually pretty rich. He's already made a product that's done very, very well. And he could go out there on his own and build a product and send it to market without any help from any of us, right? But he was like, I'm not quite sure if people really want this and I'm wondering if they're willing to pay for it. So I want to raise money just to see. And that's what he did. I'm gonna show you this video just because it's super funny. Um, and how many of you guys think you should create a crowdsource funding campaign after this? Yeah? Okay, well, we can, if you guys have time, there's some really good videos, especially on the Indiegogo site, to tell you like good tips and tricks for raising funds. But I would always think of this as data. Again, people often think of it as fundraising, but it's very different. Oh, yeah, dog crap. Let's rewind. Dogs are adorable, but they lick everything. That's why we invented Oracle, the solution that helps cure dog breath in less than a minute. Dog bad breath is one of the major concerns of dog owners. All we can really recommend is to brush their teeth. People don't do it because their dogs don't like it. Even when they let you brush their teeth, it won't solve the problem. Studies show that 90% of bad breath in humans comes from the tongue. I'm Dr. Bob. Ten years ago, I invented Orabrush, a tongue cleaner that helps cure bad breath. After people started using the Aura Brush for themselves, they requested that we create an Aura Brush for their dog. Aura Brush, you need to make one for dogs now. That'd be good, wouldn't it? How do you get a dog to let you clean its tongue? You don't. You let the dog do it. Having a system where the dog will clean its own tongue is very beneficial to both the owner and to the dog. It's not a chore. It's more like a treat. Ultra soft pointed bristles clean deep in the body. To watch the whole thing. Um, but it's really interesting. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people contributed to this campaign in order to buy one of these before the product existed. So that's real customer data. And if I were you, I would definitely reconsider how you think about crowdsource funding. It's not just about getting funds, it's really about like creating those first customers, creating those influencers of people who are going to go out there and talk about your product. They're willing to give you money on a hope, right? That's pretty incredible. So I would think about this question, like what data drives your startup? There's a lot of data out there. You should always have like the two numbers every morning you wake up to that help you make the decisions. Um, and you should always think about what are the macro forces? What are the industry world forces that make my business very successful or make my business unsuccessful, right? Because um, I think too often we, we know that there's data out there, but we don't take the time to make it meaningful to us. And if you guys are a startup, you have limited time, and you need to figure out how to do that. So, here's my exciting takeaways. It's basically what I just said. I should just turn to the slide. And that's it. Um, I'm here all day. I'm happy to talk about pretty much anything. As you see, I like talking, so that's not a problem for me. Um, but I'm really glad you guys joined us. I mean, we really hope to add value. Each Googler here is, um, is here to add value to your company today. So. Please take advantage of that opportunity. Thank you very much.